Let's go to Ezra chapter 4 tonight. Ezra chapter 4. And let's uh, read the first six verses. Ezra 4 and verses 1 through 6. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you. For we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. Then Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus the king of Persia hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. We'll stop there. Right after Elijah had slain 400 prophets of Baal uh, and had accurately predicted rainfall during the middle of a, a drought in 1 Kings 18, along came uh, Jezebel, Ahab's wife Jezebel, to threaten Elijah with death and said, uh, you know, God do t so much more to me if you're not dead by the end of the day. And so he has to flee into the wilderness for his life. And uh, the blessing there in 1 Kings 18 was followed by uh, threats of death and murder in 1 Kings 19. Following a revival among the people and laying the foundation of a new temple, suddenly here comes a depression. People wanting to discourage the work from being completed. Every mountaintop experience that you and I may have as believers seems to be followed by some uh, trip through a valley, maybe a valley of tears, a valley of uh, sh sorrow, the valley of the, shadow, of the valley of the shadow of death. But uh, the enemies of Israel are called the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin there in verse 1. And uh, they're listed a little more specifically, if you want to go forward a couple of pages to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. And notice down there in verse 7. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians... And the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth. So there um, Ammonites, Ashdodites, Arabians. Look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 says, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. The, uh, the main Arab leader was named Geshem the Arabian, here in Nehemiah 6.1. And you might keep your finger there in um, Nehemiah 4 until a little bit later. But uh, the many races of the Middle East, uh, or Arabia, or the Arabic races, as we might call them, were descended from Ishmael back in the book of Genesis. Ishmael's mother was uh, Hamitic, Hagar the Egyptian, mentioned in Genesis 16, the first four verses. She was the handmaiden of Sarah. And uh, you recall the story when Sarah was unable to bring, uh, give Abraham a, a son. Uh, they thought they would get ahead of God's timetable. And she said, go in unto my handmaiden, Hagar, maybe God intends for us to have children by her. Since in that time, Hagar was merely property. And so anything the servants had was essentially the property of the owner. But that's not what God had in mind. God said that Sarah would bring forth a son. And uh, then when, when um, um, 
Sarah had a son when uh, Isaac was born, the, uh, the Bible says that the son of the handmaiden uh, was heard to be mocking um, Isaac. And uh, no doubt his mother had planted the seeds that one day you're going to inherit everything our master possesses. And his own wife uh, is unable to give him a son, but I've done so. And, but um, the Egyptians were descended from Ham, one of Ham's sons. Uh, Genesis chapter 10 was named Mizraim. And Mizraim translates into the word Egypt. And um, it's mind-boggling how the, the conflicts of the Arabs and the Jews have not abated in over 3,000 years. It's still going on now. And uh, that, that event, or this event rather, we're reading about now, when um, they come in to try to demoralize the, the Jews in building the temple, this happened 1,500 years, at least 1,500 years before Muhammad was ever born. And um, the, the resentments of the resentments of the Arabs toward the Jews have nothing to do with any religious differences. But it has, the, has to do with the bitterness, a lingering bitterness over the fact that Abraham did not grant his possessions to Ishmael. He was passed over and rejected, and the promises were given to Isaac. And he was cast out. Go, go back, if you will, to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis 21, and uh, let's begin there with verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son, meaning Ishmael. God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. And uh, also run forward to the New Testament to the book of Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4, and let's begin there at verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, uh, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. There he's referring to Ishmael and uh, Isaac. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And... We have to make great spiritual application for ourselves in the New Testament that um, in the Lord Jesus Christ there is a freedom and a liberty to worship God and to approach God and to implore God's mercies and to plead with God and to have intimate fellowship with God and none of it requires a special priesthood None of it requires uh, some sort of racial genealogy that you can produce. None of it requires special costumes of the priest. None of it requires animal sacrifices. None of it requires the burning of incense. Uh, none of it requires making 12 loaves of bread every day and uh, showbread laying, laying it out on a table before God. None of it requires special furniture or lighting of lamps in a tabernacle or a temple. None of it requires a kosher diet. None of it requires 
uh, only worshiping or, or uh, uh, being, being sure to worship on the Sabbath day without fail, or bringing an offering to the priest to have him offer it on your behalf for your sake and your sins, uh, a Christian can approach the, the God of Israel, the God of the Jews, without any of that. And there is a tremendous freedom that we have, uh, and so much so that if a person is truly born again, and this sounds heretical because so many people are stuck on the flesh and they think somehow they have to earn it, but if a person is truly born again by the quickening power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Christ has cleansed them from their sin by faith, that person can't lose their salvation no matter what they do. And I think I mentioned on Sunday that even if you haven't lived for Jesus Christ, you've done very little for the Savior since the day you were saved, you're still getting a new body at the rapture. Think about that. <laughs> Talk about getting something you truly really don't deserve and you've been working hard to prove that you didn't deserve it. You're going to get it anyway. That is the power of eternal security. And letting Jesus Christ do the saving, let him do the keeping, let him write your name in heaven, let him um, intercede for you uh, between you and God when you're not sure what to say or how to approach God. Let Jesus Christ uh, step in where you are weak and where you fail and you, you, have, uh, you don't have uh, the necessary faculties to uh, say and do uh, and approach God as you want to. Uh, that's when you have to trust the interceding work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to convey to God what you need to say and uh, express to him your deepest wants and desires when um, words fail you. Words will never fail the Lord Jesus or the Holy Spirit. But there is tremendous liberty for the believer and there's great bondage for the unbeliever. The unbeliever is trying to earn his way into the presence of God. Now, he may not phrase it that way, and he probably doesn't put much thought into it to think that what I'm really trying to do is earn my way to heaven. He doesn't process it and think it through that far. That's the sad uh, truth of the generation we live in. But that's nevertheless the case. He's depending on ritualism and formality and certain ceremonies, and certain garments of his minister, and certain things recited at special services. He's depending on customs and traditions that are supposed to be uh, identified with Christianity to somehow get him to heaven. And if it's not those means, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, in Roman Catholicism, it's all theater. It's, it's theatrics. And why... Uh, over a billion people in the world can't see it is because they are willingly ignorant of it. When you see a, the priest starts at the, the entrance to the church, he goes to the back of the church, uh, in the back of all the pews, and he processes up the center aisle when the mass gets started in his robe and the little altar boys or the altar servers in their robes. Someone's carrying a cross. Someone's carrying maybe a, a, a couple of altar kids might be carrying candles. Someone's carrying a big missile or a prayer book um, and the, the priest and they all get up to the front facing the big crucifix on the wall and then in unison they've practiced to bow together kind of like the, the fab four remember when the Beatles all bow together at the end of a <laughs> well this is basically how they do and uh, and everyone goes takes their their respective places and the mass gets underway well this is a costume the book he's going to read from is a script. All these candles, maybe incense, depending on what kind of service it is, uh, all of these are props. And it's the same play that's uh, acted out every service. Every service starts the same way and then concludes with the, the wine and the wafer being supposedly transformed into the body of Christ. And I've wondered, why don't you just make one big batch at the start of a week and then just kind of dispense it throughout the week? But they have to go through this entire ritual, this entire reenact, the same uh, play, the same drama, every single mass. Very, 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 with little 
variation in it. But everybody's mesmerized and they think that uh, this man is my mediator between me and God. And I listen to his words to learn what I, I need to know about God. Um, I was watching a rerun of William F. Buckley's Firing Line show. I've been watching a lot of those lately. And he was interviewing some Catholic priest and some British uh, convert to Catholicism. And this fellow was gung-ho to um, be orthodox and learn and, and, and insist on Catholic tradition and ritual with a priest. He's trying to be more modernized after Vatican II where, where everything was no longer in Latin, now it's in English. And, and uh, William F. Buckley, who was a lifelong Catholic, he said, uh, I consider my, I'm a practicing Roman Catholic, and he was bemoaning the, the modern changes to the Catholic Mass. He said, uh, I go there, and before, uh, I could sit quietly, and the priest was, would mediate between me and God. That's how he described it. And now I find that I'm having to embrace strangers, because they, they ask the parishioners to you know, greet one another. And uh, I listen to children. He says, children who can barely carry a, a tune, strumming their guitars to sing in the church, and that's not the kind of music he was used to hearing. And he just wanted to sit there. Effectively, that's really what he said, is that I wanted to sit there and be told what to know, what to believe, what to think. It's very sad for a man who was so um, well-educated and well-spoken. But that's effectively what he, he said. And that's very unfortunate. That's too bad. But, but man-made religions, man's effort to reach God or approach God, is bondage. It's bondage. Just when you think you've done everything necessary, then you find out your church doesn't believe anybody can know for sure if they're going to heaven. We hope that we are. We hope that we've done enough. Ask any cult if they know for sure they're going to heaven and they have no absolute certainty. That's something we put in the hands of God. We believe if we're obedient, uh, we trust things will turn out in our favor. But they cannot say any, make any absolute claim that I know right now with absolute confidence I'm going to heaven when I die. They don't say things like that. Uh, if, it, if they could, then it would take away the, the necessity for, their, to, the, for them to be dependent on their church. When you know something is accomplished, by faith in Jesus Christ, then you're not uh, obligated, you don't have to be subservient to some church hierarchy telling you what to do. The Holy Spirit works between the conscience of a man and the Word of God uh, to, to reveal the Word of God to him. The same Holy Spirit that inspired the book lives inside of your body by faith. And if he can't teach it to you, nobody else can teach it to you. Ultimately, you have to trust that the Holy Spirit will reveal the will of God as you read through the Bible um, day after day. But um, back to the point I was making earlier, uh, the resentment the Arabs and the Arab races have towards Israel has nothing to do with religion, it has to do with envy, that, God, that Abraham did not grant everything to Ishmael, and they've never gotten over that. And um, uh, Islam uh, simply exacerbates and, and, and amplifies their resentment gives them all the more encouragement to be bitter. Now, the unsaved, the unbelieving in the world have always outnumbered the true believers, and they always will. When a believer, that's a true saint of God, whether it was someone in the Old Testament trying to follow God and obey his commandments, or a believer in the New Testament, seeks to know God in spirit and in truth, as Jesus said uh, he should be known, John 4.24, it raises the ire and it raises the wrath of the non-believer because the implication is that all of their ritual and their religious formalism cannot get them to heaven. You might not say it that way, but that's what they hear, nevertheless. You might never phrase those words or say it exactly that way to them, but by watching you and your belief in a simple saving faith in the grace of God, without church membership or water baptism or any other um, 
ordinance or sacrament being needed, uh, what you are truly what you're saying to them in effect is their dependence on religion cannot get them to heaven. Now you might not say it that way, but they hear that nevertheless. And in verse two of our text. Let me turn back there too. I lost my place. Verse 2 of our text, and Ezra chapter 4. Those who would seek to stop the building project, and they feigned to be interested in helping the Jews, they said, let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. They didn't. They didn't really want to build. They wanted to do what they could to put speed bumps and roadblocks to keep the building project from continuing and uh, when Zerubbabel and Jeshua rejected their offers there in verse 3 and they resist any sort of ecumenical help then the pressure suddenly increases Uh, look back again at Nehemiah 4 verse 1 and and I hope you still have your finger there Nehemiah 4 verse 1 But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And um, then their anti-Semitism quickly emerged. Look at verse 2, Nehemiah 4, verse 2. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they... Revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned. Suddenly their, their uh, bitterness and hatred towards the Jew emerges when the Jew wouldn't grant them what they wanted. And it's amazing how it is that way today. Uh, things have not changed much. And uh, threat, they, they um, um, offer threats of war down there in verses 7 and 8. Particular eight conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it, to hinder them from proceeding with the building of the walls of the temple. And, uh, you know, in modern times, in church splits, my dad's experienced those, and some of you have been to other churches that went through those things. Um, these things appear again. They, they, they resort to ridiculing the pastor, um, criticizing his family. There's a they'll start gossip campaigns to try and undermine what he's what the pastor's trying to do at that church. And and many times there's sort of an um, ecumenical overtures made by people. Why don't we have fellowship with that other church down the street or across town and uh, do what they do and um, play our music the way they play theirs and do our preaching like they do and let's cater to the the youth department because young people always have a great wisdom you know let's give them whatever they want and uh, if that doesn't work then there's always a slander and slander the pastor accuse him or whisper behind his back and tell other people that he's doing something or saying something or he was seen with some woman and so forth um, to, to try and create as much distrust in the preacher as possible. And I'm fortunate that I, I'm not in a position where I have to worry about that. And uh, Pastor Kim is the kind of a man who wouldn't tolerate such as that. He, I'm telling you, when he's got a little bit of a, he can be a little feisty. And if something crosses him and he doesn't like it, well, he'll let you know. And uh, <laughs> he got upset with me one time and let me know. And I, 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 where did this come from? Kind of came out of the blue. But, but uh, he's, a, he's a no-nonsense guy and is not going to put up with anyone trying to undermine the ministry that God's given him or to do anything that would subvert it or destroy it. And um, I may be getting ahead of myself, but look at Ezra chapter 4. We'll start at verse 7. And in the days of Artaxerxes wrote Bishlam, Midradath, Tabiel, and the rest of their companions unto Artaxerxes, king of Persia, 
and the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. Reham, the chancellor, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, in this sort. Then wrote Reham, the chancellor, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, the Dineites and the Apharsethites, the Tarpalites, the Apharsites, the Akavites, Archivites, the Babylonians, the Susankites, the Dehavites, and the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Asnepur brought over and set in the cities of Samaria and the rest that are on this side the river and at such a time. Verse 4 says, Then the people of the land weaken the hands of the people of Judah. Um, as soon as Sanballat and, uh, not Sanballat, Zerubbabel and Jeshua rejected the offer of all of these strangers to let us help, let us be part of your building project, uh, then suddenly those people turned. They, they weren't friendly uh, anymore to them. Verse 4 says, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. All these people of the land probably didn't belong in the land. Um, and the ones that were listed down there in verse 9, which we just read, they had been relocated from other countries by an earlier king of uh, Syria, uh, Assyria called the noble Asnapur in verse 10. And there's a more complete list found. If you want to go back to 2 Kings 17, and I won't have you turn anywhere else after this. 2 Kings 17 And let's begin there at verse 24. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. They had been relocated from other countries, perhaps when word came that the Jews were coming back to uh, their land, to Israel, and they were going to resettle in their old land and perhaps rebuild their temple. And uh, they were called, they were then, after that time, they were then called Samaritans, but they did not come from Samaria. Just as the Palestinians today uh, don't come from Palestine. The original people living there when God brought Israel into that land in the Exodus, they could have been called Palestinians if you wanted to call the land Palestine at that time. Really, Palestine is derived from the name of the Philistines. That's where the name comes from. It's derived from them. But... Um, the Palestinians there today are not from Palestine. There's about 4 million people, maybe more than that, 4 million Palestinians living in the West Bank. And of those 4 million, only about a half a million, maybe, maybe 600,000 uh, were actually born there. Everybody else is an import. And they've been sent there and they've come there from uh, Libya and from Egypt and from Syria and from Jordan, and from Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, um, and probably all of them with terrorist intent to relocate there and disrupt the, the stability in the state of Israel today, um, and to cause hardship in the Jews' land. They say they want peace, but they don't. Do you know there could be peace in Israel if all of those displaced Arabs and all of those displaced uh, Iraqis and Egyptians and so forth were to be received back in the countries where they came from. Those countries have more than enough space to offer them land. But you know something? The quality of life, the standard of living uh, for the Palestinian in Israel is higher than it is in any Muslim country. And it's, it's lush, it's vegetation, it's well uh, watered, it's green vegetation and it's a beautiful country and a lot of places to look at, unlike the dry, uh, arid climates of all the countries around them. And I've often thought, 
why don't those Arab nations do what the Jews did when they began to resettle there after 1940? Why don't they do what the Jews did and begin importing trees by the thousands and the millions? Do you know the, those Arab states have more than enough money? They've got more money than I have. And they can, and they can <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, but uh, they, could, they could import, they've got, probably got more money than Israel has because of oil. But you see these uh, uh, oil sheiks and multi-billionaires who would rather have a gold-plated faucet in their bathroom and their toilet than, uh, than their people to live in a more uh, lush, uh, vegetated landscape. They could do that. They could re do what the Jews did and began planting trees and, and um, vegetation all around their country. And the tree growth, or rather the trees planted in Israel, something like 20 million trees, or maybe more than that since 1948, to green up the country, um, attracts rainfall. That's a sort of reciprocal um, effect of attracting rainfall to that part of the country. The rain falling on nothing but dirt and sand isn't going to produce much in the Arab countries, but it produces in the land of Israel. And it, Israel is, a, is one of the most modern and modernized nations on earth. Think of the technology that they have, the, the um, high-tech industries that are there, plus uh, farmland and a number of other, um, many other things that, that they produce. And uh, Proverbs 6 uh, says, Jealousy is the rage of a man. And I wondered, why don't those countries do what the Jews do? It's because then they would have to admit that the Jew was smarter than they were. Or the Jew did something that they weren't smart enough or energetic enough or willing to do. Um, and so they don't want to admit that the Jew had a good idea. And that we can duplicate it in our nations. So they'd rather just um, listen to the preachings of uh, Muslim uh, clerics and uh, talk about the destruction of the state of Israel and the eventual overthrow of the state of Israel. And uh, on, on um, maps of Palestine, or the Palestinian uh, schools and Syrian schools, the children see maps, ge geographic maps, and the state of Israel is not even depicted on geography maps unless it's got a dotted line around that area, calling it the occupied territory to create a negative view of Israel in the minds of uh, Islamic school children. And the sad thing is, some of those textbooks that are used in Palestinian public schools are printed by American publishing companies. Talk about people selling their souls to the devil uh, for a few bucks. But God knows what's going on, and God's got it all in, uh, under control.